Welcome to To The Point. The state legislature, like many of us here in Michigan, are taking a spring break. But lawmakers still have a lot on their to-do list when they get back to Lansing. We talked with Kent County Democratic Representative Phil Skaggs about one big item the legislature will have to deal with when they return, and that is the budget. Representative, thanks for being back. And I, I, we were talking before we went on about the difference in the pacing of last year's session versus this year's session. And uh, you had an interesting observation about things that you know were kind of uniformly agreed on by Democrats that were taken care of last year. And now you're working, and we'll get to this hopefully later in this segment, um, on these things that take a long time because you have to get all the input from all the stakeholders. So the timing has changed a little bit, but one thing that remains the same is your first and, and major priority in many ways every year is to get a budget done. And I know you've got some priorities on that. Um, could be an interesting year with the budget because last year there was plenty of money to go around. And this year I should point out, that the economies uh, of the state still looks pretty healthy and the revenues are coming in uh, and that's good news but not not the kind of money yet not the nine billion extra dollars you had last year so talk to me as we enter this process because it'll really get um, underway you've already started and you're looking at it but heavy lifting in votes probably after the special elections when Democrats presumably will retake that 56-54 majority. Yeah, great to be here, Rick. Uh, budget season has sprung. We've already held uh, hearings in the various committees uh, that I'm on and that others are on. And just taking a look at the whole process, what the governor recommended to us, uh, as well as what some state house priorities are, bringing in stakeholders from everything from roads and bridges to higher education, K through 12, uh, and just taking a big holistic look at where we're at. Obviously last year, as you mentioned, there was a great deal of uh, federal money that was coming down on us, and we're really proud of the investments that we made in, in Michigan's people. Um, we did some great work out here in West Michigan, supporting everything from fire stations to Grand Valley State University's new uh, Blue Dot Tech Center. Um, and all sorts of other things, all the way to giraffes at the zoo. Um, so we really invested our communities and we're proud of that. We're back at it again. Obviously, you know, the votes will take place once we get back up to the full voter approved strength of 56 to 54. Um, and we'll be having to make some tough decisions as always because there's a great many needs out there in the community. Uh, we really want to invest in people and but there's only so much money to go around so we'll be doing the heavy lifting to make sure that our priorities are the priorities of the michigan people you're kind of represent the southeast part of the metro area uh, what are some of the priorities for that area and for elsewhere in the state that you would like to work on in this budget cycle well i think for for the areas that i represent kentwood east grand rapids parts of forest hills public school district these are strong vibrant communities with a wonderful sense of of community and are really focused on public education so i'm on the school aid fund and we have done really amazing work i think in in that space we had the highest per pupil funding in the history of the state of michigan we fully funded special education for the first time in history, even though we were had long been under a, a court order to do so, but we were finally able to do it this year. We funded transportation. We funded uh, increased funding for at-risk students. And then, uh, as many parents now know, uh, we funded free breakfast and lunch for every public school student. So those were programs that we were able to afford in part because of that federal money that came in. And we really want to focus on making sure that we're able to continue those programs into the future. Something that happened a little earlier that I always think is worth talking about is not only did you have the highest per pupil funding ever, but that is equalized now, and that all schools are participating equally, which for a long, long time they were promised, but it didn't happen. So now when you talk about highest per pupil funding, that's to every school district in the state, and that's important. 
I tell you, we were big winners in that last process because it was a lot of school districts in West Michigan that were disadvantaged on per pupil funding. It was the same thing for, for higher education funding. Uh, Grand Valley State University was one of the three lowest state universities that got state funding and now we've equalized that as well. So all across the board, uh, we're getting our fair share and uh, you can rest assured that the West Michigan delegation uh, is going to continue to make sure uh, that our voices are heard and that we get our fair share of the tax dollars that we put into Lansing coffers. There'll be plenty to talk about in the budget and there'll be more time to do it and hopefully we'll have a chance to get another conversation before we get to about the 1st of July when I anticipate that will be wrapped up and sent to the governor because a whole bunch of your colleagues are going to go back to their districts and do some campaigning because it is an election year. But I want to move on to something else. We've talked about it in the past but you're still working on it and we saw uh, an ugly, unfortunate representation of it right here in Grand Rapids, and that's exploitation of child labor and child labor laws. I know you have and are still working on that. What are you trying to accomplish, and where are you in the process? Well, as you mentioned, uh, a year ago, around a year ago today, we had an expose in the New York Times about children that were being exploited, both U.S. citizens and uh, documented immigrants that were being exploited by unscrupulous employers. We have very strong labor laws here in Michigan that we can all be proud of. The problem really is that we don't have sufficient penalties to lead to deterrence, uh, and we're not always aware exactly where these teenagers are working so that we can check in on them and make sure that they're not working too many hours, too late at night, in hazardous or dangerous conditions. So two bills that I'm working at, one increases the penalties for violators of our child labor laws. Now, mom and pop who maybe have someone scoop ice cream too late at night on July 4th uh, are going to uh, be reminded of what the labor laws are. But people who are uh, who are knowingly, willfully violating the law, it's time that we you know, bring the hammer down on that and protect our children. Um, so we're increasing penalties. Also, and I had a meeting about it today with a young entrepreneur who is really developing a wonderful app that would create a system uh, which I think could be a model for the entire nation. Right now, uh, students who want a youth work permit go to their high school. Which, look, in the 1970s, that made sense. Uh, we didn't have the internet, and high school was the government institution that, that, they uh, that young people with, yeah. interacted yeah. with. Um, and we want to keep an eye on those, and the, and the school districts are really good at keeping an eye on their, on their students because teenagers should be focused on education. Um, some side labor is very good for them and work habits um, and bringing in additional money for their family. Um, so it's all very good, but we just want to make sure that they're not in those dangerous, uh, dangerous conditions. So this uh, new system would have them over an app or the internet uh, inform the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity at the state that they're interested in employment. They'd then have everything checked, uh, and then they could go to an employer, say, I am eligible for employment. The school would be informed. Obviously, the, the caregivers, the grown-ups, mm -hmm. the parents would have to uh, sign off on this employment. And that way, the state inspectors know where the children are working so we can stop by, make sure that they're safe. Uh, as a parent of a 15-year-old who uh, is looking for a job this summer, that's good news. Um, one of the, the things is, and you mentioned it briefly, but I think this is really in addition to the hours, in addition to people taking unfair advantage, it's putting young workers in dangerous conditions, which is part of what we saw um, in Grand Rapids. I mean, that's a real key component because it, it's one thing to scoop ice cream, as you pointed out. It's quite another to be in a dangerous environment with heavy lifting or, or you know, machinery or equipment that can injure somebody. That's got to be pretty high. Yeah, we recently had a story out of Traverse City of, uh, of a young man, um, 17, who fell from a roof on a residential construction site uh, and was seriously injured. Looks like probably a paraplegic for life. Should not have been... Uh, should not have been employed in the construction industry to move into that kind of dangerous condition up on a third story roof um, and should have been on a harness up there if, if he was an adult. 
Um, so multiple labor laws were broken there, uh, and we need to have stricter enforcement because we need to keep all of our kids safe. Uh, and, and just a final note about this, because you said a couple of times we can visit, we can enforce. Um, one of the questions is, do you have enough people to do that? I mean, because it's a big job trying to, you can't be everywhere. It is one of the things that we put into the last budget with some of the funding that we have, and we're going to be working to put more of it in the budget, and that is to actually have people at the Department of Labor uh, who are dedicated to inspecting sites. Again, that's why we want to have uh, where they're working, not in random file cabinets at high, high schools throughout the state, right. but in one yeah, central, central location yeah. where these inspectors then know where the, the teenagers are working and can check in on them. All right, let's talk about one final issue in the two and a half minutes we have left. You've been working on septic legislation, which probably doesn't make big, big headlines, but it impacts a lot of people. Well, it should make big headlines. It's always a big uh, hit when I go for March's reading month and read to the first and second graders, and they'll ask what bills or ideas I'm working on, and I talk about one of my bills is about poop. <laughs> um, so, yes, a, a very significant number of Michiganders are on septic systems, uh, on-site wastewater uh, treatment facilities. That's fine, but we need, we are the only state in the union that does not have a statewide septic code that has periodic inspections of those to make sure that they're not leaking mm -hmm. pollutants into the groundwater that then goes into the creek and the stream and the river and eventually gets into our lakes. It uh, causes tremendous amounts of, of danger to, uh, to humans. The MSU did a study. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't involved in it, but it tested the E. coli ba bacteria in the water. There's two variants of this bacteria. One feeds on uh, cow feces, the other on human feces. All 34 rivers in the Lower Peninsula in Michigan are infected with human feces uh, eating uh, E. coli bacteria. We need to clean that up, stop beach closures, keep our drinking water safe, because if your septic is leaking, um, then your neighbor, neighbor who's using well water may have infected well water. So this is uh, about stopping pollution, about making sure people have clean drinking water and clean water to recreate in. And it's also uh, a little bit about standardizing the process because in the county uh, township, I should say where I live, we do have regulations about how often they have to be inspected. In the township I lived in previous, as far as I'm aware, there were no such regulations, so it's kind of a patchwork of how things are being taken care of. Yeah, we definitely don't want to have a patchwork system. Here in Kent County, we don't, we don't have any inspection, and we are a growing community spreading out uh, beyond the uh, water sewer infrastructure of our municipalities, and that's where we're getting more septics. So um, a uniform system where we have uniform licensing, um, uniform regulations for what an inspection is, how often it should happen, um, will make a lot more sense in, in dealing with the issue of beach closures and unsafe drinking water. Representative, as always, it's nice to have you. Come back, we'll talk about budget as we get closer to the season. Call me anytime, Rick. Right, thanks. Republican Representative Brian Postuma says it's time to start looking at the state's revenue with a critical eye, and his idea would be to let taxpayers keep more of their income. Representative, it's great as always to have you back. And I, I don't know how long it's been. It hasn't been that long, but something caught my eye uh, in the past couple of weeks. And it was a release that your office sent out, and it talked about doing away with income tax. And right. I said, well, wait a minute. And I went back and read it again. You deal with the idea that we had an income tax reduction of two tenths of a percent? Yep. Um, and that was for the year when the revenue ex exceeded the growth limit yeah. that the legislature had put in play. But after rulings by a number of different individuals and courts, that went away for this year and is yep. back up to, we're at 4.25, right? right? So with all of that said, we're paying 4.25%. One of the things you talked about in that release is you would like for that reduction of 0 0.20 to remain. Yep, yeah. So what does that do to the budget? Well, well, I, I think there, there's a couple things. No, number one, I, I believe that we should be looking at how our state government is funded as a whole. Do we actually need the income tax at all? But at a bare minimum, why are we increasing it? Why are we increasing our income taxes from from what we paid in, in 2023? We we should keep them lower and and then then look at the overall the overall picture and can we get rid of them? 
What does that mean, dollars and cents wise? You know what that is? From the standpoint of removing it entirely? With the point two oh, what is that? Not enough to make a difference to, <laughs> to for, for the state state government. Look, uh, the un, under Governor Whitmer, our, our state budget has grown by over 40%. We give billions of dollars in, in subsidies to uh, Chinese companies, to mega corporations. Uh, why not put a little bit of that back in the pockets of everyday Michiganders? When you talk about, and, and I don't want to get too far away from taxes for a minute, but you bring up investments in the economy and building new jobs and those type of things yeah. that the governor has talked about. Yeah, the Republican Party um, and uh, some of the leaders in the party have been pretty critical of how the governor uh, has gone about this. Do you think, and I, this is separate from the, the tax issue, but do you think it is important for Michigan to invest in businesses to, to attract them or keep them here? Or is that um, a function of the market driving uh, the need and desire for those companies? To be? So, uh, first of all, as a as general theory, I, I believe that we should be looking at a free market approach. That being said, I think right now, as long as other states are investing heavily in economic development, we can't. And they are. We we can't yeah. not do that. We have to stay competitive and we, we have to we have to be investing in it as a state in economic development. But as long as the government's definition of a return on investment is if I put in a dollar, how many dollars can I match in private investment? That's that's not a return on investment. That that gives no indication as to whether or not a business is going to be successful. As long as legislators are required to vote on economic development without seeing an economic impact study, like it, it's doomed to fail. So we have to, if we are going to be participating in that, we actually have to take a sensible approach to it. All right, let's get back to income tax. Okay. So it's two different things. One is, <laughs> you know, keeping the point two zero. Yep. But taking the 4.25 yep. and doing away with it, I suggest would leave a big yeah. hole yep. in, in the, the general fund. And you would have two choices, find another revenue source yep. or cut. What would you do? Well, it, so by, by right now we're, we're in the, the process of casting a vision. I, I believe that, that Michigan is, is in need of, of leadership that casts a vision of where we can go as a state. And so I, I'm casting a vision of the idea of, all right, how do we fund our government? Is, is an income tax the right way to do that? I don't, I don't think it is. I don't know that it is. Uh, look, uh, uh, you know, the governor announced the recent population commission. Well, the top five states in, in the country that are growing all five of them have a lower income tax than us. All five of them. Some of them don't have any income tax. Maybe rather than reinventing the wheel, we take a look at what some of those states are doing. And, and so it comes down to, all right, do we cut the budget? There's plenty of room there. I mean, look, our, our budget was $81 billion, I believe, uh, last year. Uh, Pennsylvania's was in the, in the low 40s, and they're bigger than us. So... All right, that, that's one place that we can start. Another place that we can look at is why are we giving billions upon billions upon billions of dollars to Chinese corporations and mega corporations? Well, let's, maybe, maybe we don't do that. Then, then that frees up the opportunity to reducing the income tax or getting rid of it as a whole. Well, I, I appreciate the fact when you talk about those investment, and that's kind of a nebulous thing. You say we're not going to spend those billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But there are other billions of dollars that you're going to have to account for. Right. And so what is it generically that you would look at? You've seen the budget. You've dealt with the budgets. Yep. What is it generically that we are spending money on that Pennsylvania isn't? And where are we not getting a return yep. on our investment? Because nobody wants to say cut the school aid fund. Yep. Nobody wants to say cut higher education. Nobody wants to say cut anything. Exactly. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or a Democrat. You don't want to cut things. But you're going to have to. So where does right. that happen? It, it, you know, this is a this is a long term vision that I, we're we're putting out there, and we're going to put together a work group to to take a look at you know the the ins and outs of it. Uh, so the short answer is I don't know yet. I don't know. Let, we we need to look at it though. But if, if somebody if some, somebody doesn't step up and say, hey, maybe this is possible, then it's never going to get done. You have to start somewhere. You know, you've you said a couple of times you're trying to help create a vision, and I, as I sit here and think about this. If you do kind of throw out the norms and start thinking of a new way of doing things, is it possible that you sit down with members, maybe like-minded, maybe not, in your own party, maybe younger members such mm -hmm. as yourself, maybe members from across the aisle, 
and talk about this kind of thing? Yes, yep, a absolutely. It, it'll, be, it, it'll be conversations with a lot of people, whether it's on my side of the aisle or the other side of the aisle. I think it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to have those conversations with people on the Dem in the Democrat Party because their style of government necessitates a larger budget, necessitates higher levels of taxes than, than typically what the philosophy of, of uh, conservatism does. And so those conversations are gonna be a little bit more difficult. Uh, but I do believe we could get some buy-in on, on my side of the aisle. All right, I'm interested in this, and I want you to come back and talk more about it when the conversation has moved on down the road or when the <clears throat> firestorm has started, whichever one comes right. first. Uh, let's talk for a minute about this legislative session. Yeah. Um, uh, I had this conversation with a number of uh, your colleagues, both sides of the aisle, but it is hard not to recognize and talk about the fact that the stark difference between 12 months ago and now is amazing. I think I said at some point, uh, maybe in last week's show, that the legislature is off to a slow start, but compared to the year before, anything would have been a slow start right. because it was everything all at once, big stuff moving all at the same time. Much different this time around, 54-54 tie because of a couple of members going uh, into mayoral office, special elections that I make the assumption will give Democrats back their 56, 54 mm -hmm. um, advantage. Uh, do things change after those April elections? Uh, I, I think so. A assuming the Democrats win both of those seats, which is, isn't a foregone conclusion, but it will be difficult for Republicans to mm -hmm. pick one of them up. Uh, if, if Democrats regain control, uh, yeah, I believe that uh, there's going to be a, a fury of, of legislation passed, and then we're going to get into budget season, and we're going to be working on the budget. And, and so, yeah, the, the pace is going to change. Look, I, I mean, I, I believe in the last six months we've only passed like 26 bills out of the House. Historically, it's probably closer to 100 or 150. So when you when you think about it in those terms, uh, you've got you'll come back in late April with those new members. You have May and June. Yep. The budget's supposed to be done by the first of July from a statute standpoint. That doesn't give you a lot of time to do a, a lot of, uh, I mean, yes, there's plenty of time to pass other bills, but you're really gonna have to focus on that budget. And, and in that question, let me ask this. Is it going to be more difficult for Democrats to keep 56 on board for this budget, particularly if the governor is asking for some things that may be contrary to some of those members' desires? Yeah, I, I think it's going to be extremely difficult for them to do that. There's, there's a, a few people in the Democrat Party that uh, didn't vote for the governor's budget last time, and I think that'll probably be the case this time. And uh, So we'll see how that turns out. Hopefully it's a reasonable a reasonable budget. I don't foresee that happening. We'll, we'll see. I was a no last time. I expect I'll be a no this time, but I'm keeping an open mind. I got about a minute left, and, and just thinking about what the remainder of this year holds. There's the budget, which is something you have to get done. Yep. There probably is some legislation, but then there's an election. <clears throat> yep. So from about the 1st of July until about the first part of November, there's going to be very little activity right. in Lansing. Um, how important is this election? How much emphasis is going to be put on it? Understanding that statewide, if you, if you take away the U.S. House, the open state Senate seat, U.S. Senate seat, which is a big deal, the race for president, the race for the control of the state house is kind of it, right? Yeah, I, I believe that the, the election for the House of Representatives this term is the most important race in the country outside of the presidential election. I think it's critically important. We need to provide a backstop for the taxpayers here in Michigan to curb some of the, the rampant progressive leftist policies that the Democrats are jamming through. Representative, I hate to cut you off, but we're gonna have to leave it right there. All right, Thanks perfect. for being on. Thank, Thank you. you very much. When lawmakers return to Lansing, there will be plenty of work to do, but if April looks anything like the first quarter of the year, it may be hard to find bipartisan cooperation. And that's something we'll be keeping an eye on to the point.